Hi, I'm so happy to have our clinical director of the Seeking Integrity Los Angeles program, residential treatment program for men here, Erin Snow. She's joining us tonight. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. So, so she works directly with, uh, she oversees all aspects of the program. So, you know, so the, the, I hope that people will be asking questions, but we will talk about, you know, all the aspects of things that we see, you know, happening, you know, both from the client side, you know, the men who are coming to us for help with sex addiction, porn addiction, intimacy disorders, some have co-occurring chemical addiction, but also from the partner, spouse, loved one side, side of it and how that all, you know, interacts. So we can talk about all of that. Um, we also have a, and Aaron can tell you more, but we have a, a an in-person betrayed partner retreat series um, that we're going to launch in January. So yeah. we are all like, I don't do cartwheels, but I almost could with this. So I'm super excited about all this. I am too. I I think one of the areas that inspires us is, is we have so many amazing women uh, and, and betrayed partners in general that are like, when is it my turn to do my work? You know, obviously there's a need for treatment um, for the men coming into our program, but the women are like, God, I am, I am struggling. I, I have trauma that really looks like PTSD in the brain, honestly. So we're finally creating a space for women to be able to come and work on that in a direct way. And the first one is going to be pretty awesome because we're kind of, it's the kickoff, the kind of the flagship for the rest of the series. And so all of the therapists that are going to be working on this project will all be there at once. And it's going to be insane. It'll be awesome. Really. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's, uh, and different, you know, places for each person, but you know, the the point of this is, you know, I want, I want to work on me, you know, like this, the focus is on how do I get healing? How do I process through some things? So, so not about controlling what's going on externally, but you know, how do I just own that? Yeah, this has been, you know, really difficult and rough and, you know, I want to move through. Um, And she's right. You know, we, like, we're talking about like, wow, this is like the amazing opportunity with all, all of them will be good. I like, but this is, we wanted to bring everybody together and put the pieces, you know, together. So it's also the experiment and we will tweak it from there. So it's unique in January, um, but we're also planning uh, one for March and another one for June. Yeah. in different locations. So they will be yeah, we're moving all yeah. around. We're doing area it. Near you. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. So, but we're really excited about it. Um, working behind the scenes frantically to get all the components. So, so you are welcome to reach out about any of that. We do have a question. Oh, here we go, Erin. Can you see it? I do. Yeah, there it is. Okay, good. Okay. So I'm the addict. I'm about a hundred days past our most recent D-Day. My wife and I have been together for 14 years. I had an affair 12 years ago, but the full extent of it was not known until recently. My question is about the fact that my wife is convinced that she is not my type because the women I pursued in my addiction often had other body types or were younger. And she is afraid I'm staying just because she didn't leave me. I want to reassure her, but everything I try to tell her just pushes her further into being triggered. I love her deeply and I want to be with her but I don't know how to show that to her. Well, first of all, you know, you didn't necessarily say that you were sober, but being a hundred days past, you know, a D day to me says you, you are really working on what this next phase can look like. And, and I do hear your love for her. Um, so this is incredibly common, um, not just in affairs, but also in men who watch pornography that when they're discovered, there is, there's a multitude of other body types or even, um, certain fetishes or, and the partners, like, I, I don't look like that. And I don't do the things that you're watching and the things that you did with her. And that's incredibly heartbreaking for a partner because they, they ultimately already struggled with not feeling like they were enough. Um, and then learning about this and then having the trauma from the betrayal, but now feeling like I can't ever be enough. And so you're on the right track in terms of reassurance. But one thing that, that I learned recently, which is, first of all, you have to get into recovery. 
You have to actually show action steps towards, I am doing everything in my power to move forward, um, to choose you every day, you know, to walk away from the things that I've done. And, and maybe there's, you need to maybe ask her, what is, what is it that feels, you know, cause you're going to engage in your recovery. And, and I would love to see that she engages in her own healing as well. But one thing that I recently learned that was really helpful for the guys is by Carol Sheets. It's AVR. And it's easy to remember because it is just the three letters, but it's a way of communicating, but you have to actually be an act of recovery uh, to use this. So the first is acknowledge, you know, you're acknowledging that, that she's in pain and that you cause this pain. And the second is validating the feeling. And, and she uses five feelings, like basic feelings. Don't get into too much detail around, you know, I can see that you're feeling, you know, just keep it a basic level emotions, but you're validating a feeling. And then the R is the reassurance, which is something that you talked about, but you truly cannot reassure somebody unless you're in active recovery. You are working on this every day. So it's, it looks a little bit like, you know, I can absolutely see why you would be feeling the way you're feeling. And I, I recognize that my actions cause this. And then moving into, I can see that it's caused you so much sadness and pain. And all I can say is that I am in active recovery. And all I can do is one day at a time, show you with my actions that I want to change and I want to help you heal. And so that the three acronyms I think is helpful because oftentimes they don't know, our guys don't know how to sit in empathy um, with their partners because they, they, they take it personally every time. And really it's focusing on their healing. How can you help her heal? Um, and so I hope that that's helpful for anybody that's in this situation, um, but ultimately you can't say enough. It, no, I love your body or no, I, because it, the words don't mean anything, right? It's the actions that you back up that I do love you. And it's not about your body. It's about our intimacy and how much I care about you and how much I'm going to work to be a better man for you. And that the next piece comes later. And also in her healing process, recognizing she didn't cause this. It's not about her. It's not about her body. It's, it has nothing to do with her realistically. So yeah, I hope that's helpful for you. Um, AVR, it's a great technique to use. And I want to back up because I, yeah, I see, you know, I had an affair um, 12 years ago, but the full extent of it was not known until recently. So I'm thinking of your partner, your wife, who is going like, I thought I knew, mm -hmm. and now I got hit with something. So, so it, I, I can imagine how painful it is for her to feel like 12 years I only knew half of it or part of it or whatever. And yeah, the, the body comparisons, I hate when partners have the gory details, you know, like know too much. It's like it is bad enough to know, like a formal therapeutic disclosure is, you know, specific information, but it's not the compare contrast, yeah. you know, our bodies to everyone else's, you know, um, it, 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 so, so unfortunately, and that's the stuff that gets caught in head. So, so for her, um, you know, there are trauma techniques like, you know, EMDR on this, on this or somatic experience. There's, there's different trauma techniques. Yeah. So I hope she's working with a betrayed partner specialist. If she's not email me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com and tell me where you're at and I'll, I'll work on helping find, you know, someone, but um, yeah, that, that, that is like real body painful, you know, stuff, um, you know, to have that stuff and those details spinning around in your head and the comparing and all that kind of stuff, you know, so, so it's, it's more challenging. So for those of you that haven't, you know, spilled everything, there's a process, formal therapeutic disclosure. It is not a do it yourself job. You know, yeah. yes, there is discovery. People find out things, they find your phones, they find whatever. Um, and for you that think, oh, she won't find out about this or she doesn't need to know. She finds out she needs to know, and this is what happens. It's like, it's so painful, but I agree with Aaron because like, what your actions have shown is you lied for 12 years, you know, and, you know, and, and, but even before that, but for the last 12 years, there have been half truths. So your actions absolutely have to be dedicated to showing 
you know, here's my recovery work, you know, leaning into, you know, what, whatever it is, you know, whichever 12 step program you're part of, I'd go back and redo the steps because clearly there were some things that were left out. So, so you cannot do too much right now, you know, to work on your recovery, to really shore it up and make sure that your actions are aligned with, you know, healing because lip service is, Oh, I want to help her. I want to help her. That's a distraction. It's, it, you know, it's actions, my actions, you know, point me in the direction that can then partners can start to go, wait, that is different. Wait, I, I can start to have breadcrumbs of hope. So um, and, and I'm glad you're here for, for anyone, you know, on here, who's experienced betrayal trauma, just on this topic, you know, to say that it's, it's, it's easy to say it is, it's about me, right? I, it is about my body or that I wasn't having enough sex or that I wasn't meeting the needs and, and that you did not cause this. And that is important to know, but also some of what is going on is true intimacy, right? Is about a human connection. It's about sharing emotion. It's about building a life together. It's about sharing, you know, a family dreams, goals. It's about actually seeing one another. When, when we're looking at addiction and fantasy, that's objectification. That is like, I am looking at a body part. I'm, I'm going for a dopamine hit and then I'm out of here. That is a, a, you know, a hair color. Okay. It arouses me dopamine hit. I'm out of here. Like that is not intimacy and they can't build that with those things. You know, they're, they're pieces and parts and, and a lot, I mean, there's so much science behind fantasy and objectification, et cetera, but just know that it, it, it has nothing to do with, with you. It has nothing to do with you. Even though it feels like it has it so much, it, it feels yeah. so personal, but you know, it's just like, you know, the alcoholism isn't about how great the alcohol right. tastes. Sex addiction isn't about sex. I mean, it's like, yeah. it's that, just like you said, it's objective. Yeah. It's numbing out, escaping all of those things. I put in the chat, sex addiction, one oh one. Yeah. online work group starts again on Saturday, porn addiction 101. Also that's for, um, guys that all it has been is online. There's been no in-person. So, um, mm -hmm. both of them start again this Saturday. Uh, those are great yeah. online psychoeducation courses would be super helpful. So, um, check those out it, uh, they won't start again. Uh, I think until January after this one. Yeah. Okay. Next question, Aaron, let me hit, um, Okay. My partner believes that me being an addict is a deal breaker, not good success numbers in general. So she doesn't want the constant. I messed up, but couldn't help it, mm -hmm. which I admit I would use. But the fact is I really admit that my acting out was most likely choice habit easier. So I also feel that maybe being an addict is not necessarily appropriate since I really knew that the household was too busy with kids and I felt my job was overwhelming that I just doing my own thing in the bathroom was so much easier than doing the whole thing, the whole wooing thing. Yes, it cheated her, but she's so busy. She didn't complain. Now the kids are gone and my asshole is revealed. So. Okay. So there's a, there's a number of things going on in here. Yes. I understand why your partner would say being an addict is a deal breaker when you've only used it as an excuse. So kind of that's the, that's what the beginning of this kind of sounds like, like you said, I, I, you know, I messed up, but I couldn't help it. Right. That's really shirking off, you know, mm, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I did this again, but I, it was out of my control, which yes, addiction is compulsive, right. Which, which is a lack of control, even in great circumstances that are consequential and could ruin your life. Right. That being said though, if you know that this isn't a, this is a problem, right? And you're not doing everything in your power to say, yes, if this is an addiction and I've identified it as an addiction, then, and then I have to do the appropriate treatment. Just like I identified that I have cancer, I need to do the appropriate treatment. So using it as an, ex it is not an excuse. If anything, it's an opportunity to pivot and change. And also not everybody qualifies as an addict, right? One person who, you know, had one affair does not necessarily meet criteria. And you can go on our website and, and take assessments. It's really quick and easy. I put it in the chat. Okay, yeah, great. It's, it's on the Seeking Integrity homepage, but I put it in the chat for those of you joining live. Right. So not like not everybody who comes into treatment or, or wants to come to treatment is appropriate for treatment. Not everybody's an addict. Um, but you've identified that, yeah, 
my behavior was compulsive. A, is it an organic in my body? I'm itching. I can't, you know, withhold. Or like you pointed out, there's a lot of circumstantial reasons why this was your coping mechanism. This was how you dealt with being overwhelmed or feeling like, you know, but not everybody resorts to masturbation. Not everybody resorts to porn. Not everybody, you know, resorts to seeking validation from another person. Um, but that's what you resort to. So just like for myself, I, I'm in recovery. I, if I use that excuse, right? Like, yeah, I mean, damn it. I drank again, but I just couldn't help myself. That, that's, that only works the first time after that it's, it's put your money where your mouth is and you actually have to do the work so that you're not making, because there is treatment for this. If there was no solution and it was, you were just kind of out there floating around, I would understand, but there is, there is a solution for this. Um, and ultimately what she's saying is maybe, maybe when the kids were there, like that was her priority and, and she couldn't deal with the excuses or whatever was coming up for her. And now they're gone. And, and she, what she's saying is it's me and you, it's me and you left. Like, are we going to do this or are we not? And I think in terms of addiction, if she saw that you were using it as an opportunity to get better versus an excuse to stay sick, I think that her mind might change a little bit about just that title in general. Um, because the truth is, you know, we don't have concrete success numbers for a number of reasons, but what I will tell you is that men who leave our program and do what is on their aftercare plan, stay sober. We have a huge alumni community. We have, we have people that come in and they've had years and they've rebuilt marriages that were on the verge of divorce that were divorce was filed and they, they, they brought it back. Consistent change in sobriety is possible, but it takes work. Um, so yeah, success numbers again are difficult to quantify because sex addiction is not just abstinence like a substance would be. Um, it can look different. So some people may include masturbation. You look at three circles, which is a different topic. Um, it is, it's tricky. But what I say is if you're, if you're an active recovery, then you're not an active addiction. And the guys that leave our program and actually do what they're, what they created as a plan, they get it and you can too. So I, I, I hope that's helpful, but yeah, it's you and it's you and her now. And so the decision is, am I going to, am I going to do the work to help us heal? Or am I going to continue kind of down the same path? Well, and you have kids and even if they're grown, they're still your kids, you will have grandkids, yeah. you know, and so co-parenting, co-grandparenting, you know, you can continue to, as you said, be an asshole, or you can <laughs> work on being a person, a man of integrity who can show up for the family and for yourself. And yes, you know, it's, it, it's like, oh yeah, it was easy to run off to the bathroom and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, but I was, and I was like, wow, you know, so it, it, it can be a maturity. There's so much I put the assessment on. It'd be good. But I was like, yeah, she's really busy. You know, she probably could have used help. You know, there used to be a saying, I love a man with dishpan hands, you know, and it's like <laughs> helping out with stuff. You know what, then, then people, you know, then the other one doesn't feel quite so overwhelmed, but it's easier to run to the bathroom and masturbate. So, so like you have an opportunity now to go, I'm going to be a different man. It's yeah. not too late. It, it's not too late. I hope, I hope you choose it. Cause you know, we're both in recovery, the world in recovery. Dr. Rob uses this one. And I, I so agree. He said, you know, in addiction, we're in, you know, we're, it's black and white and shades of gray. It's really boring and dull. And recovery gives us technicolor you know we can appreciate you know people and experiences we can be in the moment we can connect we're not just all thinking about you know i have to run off to the bathroom so you get to really connect in in meaningful ways not just with your wife but but with your kids and and you know it's it's just different and you haven't experienced it and i would invite you to try mm -hmm. absolutely okay and the next you. one go ahead well in recovery you find different, healthier coping mechanisms, right? And what do I do when that's, you know, what's been con kind of conditioned in me to be this compulsive way that I deal with everything is finding new ways to, yeah, enjoy life again and not live with feeling like that white knuckling, like 
uh, and finding new ways to cope. So yeah, it's all out there for you. So Aaron, the next one, can you share any tips on how to get through the holidays with my mm. partner who is sober, but not yet in great emotional recovery? I see in his actions, he is not in a great place emotionally, and we are very disconnected. Holidays are challenging because we are in-house separated, yet I don't always want to be around or him to be around and just want to enjoy things with the kids. Any tips appreciated? This is a great question with Thanksgiving coming up, and I am sure you are not the only one thinking this way. Here is, here is my tip. Focus on what brings you joy. In other words, you cannot control or change kind of what's going on in his own head. And it's his responsibility to reach out and get help for that. But you can't take that on. And the holidays are really a beautiful time, but they're also a hard time. But I think if you focus on what brings you joy, and I'm talking like up your self-care game more than you ever have before, because you know you're approaching a time that's difficult. Take more walks, ground yourself, do something that, that really makes you feel good for you. Take a bath, right? Go get a massage if you can. Um, with, with the kids, like obviously you don't want to present tension and arguments and things like that in front of the kids. Um, but what can you do that shows them that you're in a place of joy? They're looking for that. They're looking at you. They're looking at him. You can't control how he presents himself, but you sure, you sure can present yourself, but, but it has to be from an organic place. So even though this is hard, I, you can be okay. Even in the midst of what feels like not the best circumstances to have a happy family holiday, but you can be okay. And you can, I'm telling you, love yourself more than you've ever loved yourself and feel empowered by that. Look like, look at how strong you really are and you can, you can carry your, your kids and, and really take everything you can out of this holiday. And he's going to have to do what he needs to do. And either he will, or he won't, you know, ask for what you need too. If you do need space. Cause you said like, sometimes I don't feel like being around him. That's okay too. Hey, um, me and the kids are going to go down and see the Christmas tree farm. Um, or, Hey, you know, you were talking about going caroling later. Why don't you take the kids and, and I'm going to take a little bit of a break for myself. It's okay to ask for what you need and you know, whether he likes it or not, you have autonomy in, in asking and your needs are important. So just really listen to yourself. And when you feel that sadness, acknowledge it, you know, hold yourself in that and then say, what is it that I can do to love myself in this moment? Where can I, where can I turn? Who can I, you know, lean on? What can I do to really love on myself? And it will help. I promise, but it is, I, I empathize with you. It's hard. It really is. And it's hard for a lot of people going through this right now. Well, and, and I, you know, I hear I agree with Aaron, everything she said about you taking care of you. But what I hear is he's not in a great yep, place. Correct. And so, so like, I, I, yeah, I agree with Aaron. What is it? But I would be really clear, like, like think about what's going to help you. Like if it's like on Thanksgiving day, I don't want to have him at the dinner table. You need to have that discussion and, and, you know, so that there's a plan and there isn't an argument on the day. So, so have a plan of how are we going to navigate this? Or this is what we're, you know, this is what I you know am willing to do, but be abundantly clear. He can go down to the mission and, you know, serve food to other people. He can be in service to others. There are 12 step meetings. Holidays are tough for people in active addiction or in recovery. Um, they're really tough for active addiction, but they're tough for people newer in recovery or sometimes even longer. So, you know, many, uh, you know, 12 step programs have a lot more connection. There's, you know, uh, if he's been in other programs there, you know, AA has a, you know, and, you know, he can just go sit in on meetings, who cares? But, you know, there are, you know, alcathons where they're 24 hours, you know, just to get people through the holidays. So, so it's up, 
to him to create his plan, working with his therapist, a sponsor, whatever, to get a plan for how he's going to get through the, the holiday, especially the next one, try just practice on one, but then, but have the conversation that this is, you know, this is my vision and here's, you know, here's how I will enter, you know, here's how I would like to be connected. And here's what, when I want to be with just the kids or the greater family or whatever. So, um, but give it some intention, maybe journal about it, you know, like what's mm-hmm. going to, you know, feel um, good and help me be congruent. I don't want to have a facade up and pretend like everything's great when it's not. So it's how can you take care of you in, in that way? So, yeah. Otherwise, you know, you can fall into the trap of allowing his mood to dictate what's happening in the moment and then making decisions based on that versus like Tammy said, when you are clear on a plan together and saying, this is not about us right now, this is about the kids and, and having this be, you know, the best experience we can given the circumstances, not allowing, you know, the mood swings or the ups and down, or I'm sad or, you know, whatever it is to dictate the plan, but instead get ahead of the plan. And yeah, it's on, it's on him to take care of himself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. The next one, I'm the SA and D day was five months ago. I've done the SA 101 and have a sponsor and working with a CSAT for three months, slipping with porn and masturbation five times, most re- recently a week ago, I have committed to going to meetings daily since, uh, to get, uh, stays, get on a path to recovery. My partner and I are preparing for disclosure. And now she's worried that I haven't had enough sobriety or done enough work to do disclosure. My CSAT hasn't said anything about needing sobriety for a period of time before disclosure. He also says it usually takes about 45 minutes. Z- oh my gosh, sorry. But my partner hears from her betrayed partners group that we should have one point five to three hours to hear disclosure and other CSATs requiring 30 to 90 days of sobriety first. Why is my CSAT saying something so different? Do I need a new CSAT? To me, that would be go talk to your CSAT. I like we're the wrong people to have that discussion with. But I would also whoever your partner's CSAT is, her. Hopefully, you are both working. Like I see lots of landmines here. Let's yeah. put it that way. And I, you know, why people want sobriety is because otherwise guess what you're going to do another disclosure and another and another right. uh, one person said we've had nine dis- disclosures i was like you know oh my gosh how painful you know the, the point of this is to do something different so right. and w- when i hear all of this slipping you know y- y- yes you can't do enough recovery work now we also have a residential treatment program. You would have a really solid foundation and be far more prepared for, um, you know, f- for this. Doing the super long ones. I mean, Dr. Rob talks about a disclosure is a couple of pages of data. You know, this long narrative, you know, it's just like, you know, shoot me now. It's like, it's too much. It's overwhelming, you know, and all of that. And you are never going to remember every single detail. And just like somebody said earlier, all the gory details is, is extra trauma for partners. So you both need a qualified professional to help guide you with this. And then your qualified professional should be talking about it. So Mm -hmm. those are the two people that should be talking about the process and navigating all of that, you know, but I would have some, I'm hearing all of this and, and via zoom, I'm like, and trust me, we've, we've figured out a lot of things since COVID. So so yes, it can be, but what's the plan? Are you in separate places? And like, there should be a whole plan of this is what we're doing, how we're showing up, you know, for this and how the safety plan for, you know, who's going to stay at the house. You know, if you like, there needs to be a plan and this does not feel like a fully thought out plan. Yes. That's my, I could go on this. So I'm going to just turn it over no, to you. Okay. So I will, I, the thing is, I wouldn't want to bash any CSAT, but I'm not bashing any. Yeah. I'm no, curious, you're not. Though. We're yeah. we're clearly avoiding that. Um, but there is a variation in, in how different CSATs do disclosures. But yeah, that is the that's the one thing that does cause concern for me here is that the CSATs are not talking. So there needs to be a, a good deal of collaboration between the CSATs, and they might want to they wouldn't want to agree on the sobriety piece. I agree with Tammy, you know. It would be, so a disclosure is kind of, I am in sobriety and now I'm doing this as, as my, like, I am all in, I am telling you and giving you with full integrity, everything that's happened. So we can turn the page and start from a fresh slate. But if that slate's not clean, because it keeps 
adding and falling off, um, then yeah, that, that would be a concern for me. So yeah, have your CSATs talk certainly. And, and again, I, I would say 45 minutes on zoom, um, sounds far too short to, to me. Um, there's definitely more of a process to this and then yeah, get some, some sober time under your belt so that you're not doing this again. Yeah. And I'm glad you did sex addiction 101. Yeah. I hope you did all three parts, you know, cause there's three parts, one, two, and three. So hopefully you did all of those, you know? So, so yeah. Um, 12 step meetings, we've got a whole list of them. You know, there's yeah. a bunch of different, you know, kinds, but you know, working where, you know, you're five months in, hopefully you're well on your way with step four, you know, but, and that's a searching and fearless moral inventory. You know, I hear all these people that go, Oh, and this is across whatever. It doesn't matter which 12 step you're part of. Oh, I've been around for two years and I haven't started. I'm still working on one, two, and three. And I'm doing this intentionally. It drives me nuts because those are the people that are constantly slipping and they don't get any traction. You know, steps four through nine, if you're working a 12 step program, that's the housekeeping. That's where you get the freedom. The promises do come true. We will be amazed before we are halfway through. That doesn't mean getting stuck on steps one, two, and three. So, yeah. enough. Okay, I will move on to the next one. Passionate about recovery. I want, I honestly, you know, and this is from a place I really, really like, I am so blessed to be in recovery and I know it. And I, I just wish people who are struggling would go, I see that. And I want that too. If you did, you would be doing everything you could to get there. And, you know, not this, oh, well, you know, I, it, you know, anyway. Okay. My husband is attending 12 step groups for alcoholism for 85 days sober. Yay. We are just now 65 days since discovery. Also, he has just started with a CSAT today. He agreed to, to work towards disclosure. What mm -hmm. signs am I looking for to see if he is working on sex addiction recovery or at this stage is what he's already doing enough? I still don't know a lot. Uh, I still don't know a lot of empathy. I have ha probably see a lot of empathy and starting to get pushback, sarcasm and gaslighting from him. So it's hard to see the good guys. The empathy is one of those, like I, I know everybody thinks as soon as people get you know, stop that problematic behavior, they're going to have empathy. They are in preschool on an empathy scale. We have to learn. We can't do, you know, uh, sophisticated empathy work. We don't, we, we don't know how to do it. So, so I would not expect to see empathy. I don't like seeing the pushback, sarcasm and gaslighting from him. And I would, you know, like I would talk to your qualified professional and I would also um, like, I don't see that he's really, ready like there's a whole bunch of stuff he needs to do and a csac can help him he just started seeing it today so i would i would the good news is he's going to 12 step hopefully he's doing you know 90 meetings in 90 days so hopefully he's on track with that but well i think aaron some of what i see missing here is he's doing 12 step for alcoholism but i don't see that he's doing 12 steps for his uh, yes, yeah, actual behavior. So, and you're saying 65 days since discovery. So that's to me, and you're working toward disclosure saying that there is a sex addiction issue in here. So that would definitely be a sign for me is that he's going to SA or SAA. Um, in addition, SLA, to SPA, and putting them all in there, there's a bunch. Yes. So, um, because 12 step for alcoholism is excellent. And I'm really glad that he is 85 days sober because a lot of those things are fused as well. And, and obviously still drinking is going to make it a lot harder for, for sexual recovery to happen. But yeah, that's one of the signs. Certainly you want to see him in, in 12 step sexual recovery with a sponsor, um, that those programs look different. They're working on different things. It's not just, um, the 12 steps are the same across all 12 steps programs. The 12 steps are the same, but there are different activities, different ways. So for instance, a three circle plan, right? Looking at your addiction cycle. So there's, and, and I'm glad he's looking to, to meet with a CSAT. Um, I, I would have liked to see him start sooner, but I'm glad that he is. And I, and I'm glad that he is willing to work toward disclosure. I would say for you also getting into, you know, your own treatment will help you to better identify what that looks like. Cause I know that especially after betrayal trauma and being gaslit and, and sarcasm and pushback, you don't know what's up or down sometimes. 
it's difficult to even trust your own intuition. Is he in recovery? Is he not? I don't know. Um, so getting some help for yourself just helps to begin that healing process for you. But yeah, you can set boundaries with that. Um, pushback, sarcasm, gaslighting, those are not signs of like real good recovery. And, and like Tammy said, just because you get sexually sober doesn't mean that you've shifted your whole personality and all the things that come with it. But there should be efforts to at least acknowledge when you're doing those things. So recovery, what I love about recovery is that you have the opportunity to own your stuff. So yeah, you know what? I was being so rude yesterday. I was feeling overwhelmed and I was totally gaslighting you because you were upset and I felt, and, and I'm sorry, you know, and, and I want to try again today to, to do that differently. So I do think that there's definitely more work to be done here, but I, I, I would love to see that he's in uh 12 step for sexual addiction. And also that his CSAT eventually could communicate with yours. And there's some, once there's sobriety on the table, that the two of you could potentially do work together um, as you prepare for disclosure. And, and this is one of those, like, I'm a little skeptical because usually people who are doing the co-occurring are hanging on to something like, you know, masturbation, porn, non-porn, porn, et cetera, food, you know, I mean, like it could switch. So, so I would really be, you know, I, and he just started with us. He said, they have online assessments. They, ha they, they can help navigate and see where he's really at with things. And our program is for, you know, again, co-occurring. And we have people who come with, you know, some abstinence already and, you know, more is, more is revealed, but, you know, so I did put, I'm putting, actually, I didn't hit you know, send. Um, there's previously recorded webinars and um, Debbie McRae's are fantastic, really yeah. point by point for betrayed partners of like, this is what accountability looks like. This is what, I mean, so check hers out. Um, yes. um, I think you will find those. And, you know, Eddie Capper, like there's a bunch of good ones, but Eddie Capparucci talks about, you know, getting to the other side for couples, you know, and I think you will see some things with that, but, you know. Um, uh, yeah, you having a plan and holding your healthy boundaries for your safety is what you can do, what he does or doesn't do, but you, but you know, you don't have to tolerate, you know, you know, the nasties he's doing too. So, okay. The next one, Aaron, um, is my partner said today in couples therapy that he, he needs me not to be cold and ignore him, his perception of me holding boundaries in order for him to feel motivated to uh, lead out and engage with me. Is this a signal that he's not in good recovery? A part of me also can understand where he's coming from, but I cannot do the work to make him feel safe or to start to rebuild the connection with us. Um, that is what I did for two decades. And now I need to experience him taking different action. What I don't he know, and I don't see in, in this, Aaron, is like, we don't even recommend couples therapy early in the process because this is what happens. It's like the coupleship is the client, not either of you. And as Aaron said with the betrayed partners, you know, this is, you know, the support and all of that. And then it's very different for addicts. So, so I'm, I don't know how long you have been in, in this process, how long he's been really doing his individual work and you have been, but right. it feels like, you know, many people are reaching out going, Hey, we need to do a couple therapy because of this, but it's very different. And, and it often can be, um, you know, I, like the partners get thrown under the bus because because it's the coupleship, not either of you. So, but maybe I'm missing something. What do you think? No, I think time frames would be helpful in here because this, if this is brand new, um, it would look different if you're five years down the road, um, right? And, Absolutely. And so, so what I see is oftentimes, yes, in betrayal trauma, you have a lot of big feelings. And you're not feeling like being super warm and fuzzy and cozy and let's cuddle up. And, you know, that's not, that's not happening right away. You have to do some of your work to feel safe in your own body and in your own emotions, right? Before you'll ever feel safe opening up to him. And he has to show again, consistent action over a period of time before you're willing to move forward. And he's got to stop, you know, a lot of his behaviors, which again, don't happen overnight which is why some of that separate work is so good before you come together. Another thing though, that we do see is let's say, so the addict is in sustained recovery 
and they are doing everything in their power and they're moving forward. Sometimes we do see a year, two years down the road that if both sides are not doing work, it makes it hard to move forward. In other words, and that's why I think our betrayed partner retreat is so important is some of these women are like, I don't know how to let go of the anger. Like, I don't know how to not be cold and angry and mad. And he is changing and he is doing better, but I can't let go of this terrifying feeling that I'm going to be betrayed again, or that I can't forgive him and I can't let go. And, and so it depends, I guess, on where you are in the process, but, you know, saying, I need you to change so that I feel motivated. That statement doesn't work for me, no matter where you are in the process. Um, because he's got to be self-motivated. Um, he can't look at you and be like, well, you're cold today. So you know what? I don't really want to do this thing anymore because it's not necessarily about whether the two of you stay together or don't stay together. It's about individual work. And then are those two healed people able to move forward together? So, yeah, I don't like that first sentence there, but other than that, you know, again, the time frame is important. There is a balance between moving forward. And what that looks like. And you didn't say your couples therapist was trained in this field. I just, I just thought of that too. So if your couples therapist is not trained in this, then they do regular couples therapy. Most therapists are not trained much in any kind of addiction work. Fewer yeah. are trained in this. And this is really, as you get complicated work. So um, if you are working with a professional that doesn't have the training, maybe a great therapist in other aspects, but is, isn't going to be able to give you what you need for safety. So, okay. My essay husband keeps telling me he has given, he's given me 40 years before he acted out. He had a long-term emotional affair, six years, chat rooms and porn. He's in, a, a, he's in fair recovery, but telling me uh, he's given me so many years. I stayed the course, not him. Why does he keep saying this? I'm telling I think telling him he is very triggering to me. Why do you think he does this? Well, that's to alleviate his own shame. Yeah. Blame shifting. Yeah. Which is like, that's like saying, I, I didn't murder anyone for 31 years. Like, but mm -hmm. <laughs> like, let me off the hook judge. Yeah. Work. I'm so grateful you were faithful for 40 years. So you say, um, but that doesn't like negate. It's not like, okay subtract the six years and I gave you 34, you know, it's, that doesn't work. And so that is blame shifting. That is him trying to say, you know, I feel shitty about this. And I would rather look at the years I did great than the years I screwed up. And that's not fair. So that's why he's doing that. And, um, it is triggering because it's basically saying you shouldn't care so much. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be so hurt by this because look at how many years I gave you. Like it was a gift or something. No, this was an agreement we made as a couple, right? To be faithful to one another. So I don't, it's not like a thank you for this, the celebration. Would you like a cookie for that? You know? So yeah, those, that's not, that's not fair. It, it's to me very emotionally immature too, but you know, yeah. um, didn't you give him 40 years and I bet you didn't have a six year affair. You, it, it just mm, no. sorry come come join the drop-in groups and stuff for betray partners on our website essay partner here i'm struggling with me being deprived of sex because my essay uh oh so this is the the partner here i got mm -hmm. it okay never mind uh, be, because my sex addict is working through his stuff how do couples both uh, trying to work on recovery, uh, have their sexual needs met when the SA has no interest in sex with their partner. It's so confusing. That it is. So sex kind of needs to be off the table in the beginning. And the reason is for a couple of things. One is when we're not healed emotionally and sex becomes a physical act, it can be very confusing for both. Um, the, the sex addict is trying to get into recovery where they're having kind of a plan and they're managing their, uh, their program and their body and their urges and, and their fantasy. And they're working through that for the partner. It can feel like a uh, connection and it, but it can also bring up a hell of a lot of, of trauma in the process of where has he been? What has he been doing? So it's, it's tough. Obviously 
you know, if you're going to remain together and you want to heal together, sex is part of that process. Um, and, and some, I would say people vary on this, the length of time. I think it's really more dependent on where the couple is in their work versus like a, a set time. It has to be, um, but yeah, you have to ask yourself, you know, if sex is off the table for this time, what are the reasons that that is happening? Why does he have no interest? Why am I feeling that I need this to be okay in our relationship right now? Have we built emotional intimacy yet? Is it safe to start having sex again? And, and if it's been a while, right. And you're, you've been in this process for a while, then, you know, sex therapists can sometimes help with this, um, sense and focus is an exercise by masters and Johnson. It, it alleviates some of the pressure around just orgasm being the goal. It's more about how can we engage in with intimacy back into physical touch. So it's kind of a graded task assignment where you're starting with, you know, our clothes are on, we're sitting up, but we're holding hands. Then it goes to kind of the next level where obviously you end up with you know, physical interaction involving genitalia, but orgasm is not the goal. It's sharing my needs. It's being present with you. It's feeling you. So it sounds like there's got to be some kind of process back to sex for you guys. And there may not be a road, you know, a map to get there. And so seeking some help to, to figure out a what's under the surface here and help you guide and I help guide you back to a physical place where you're both comfortable and feel safe uh, would be advised. It is confusing though. And this is, this is often a, a problem, you know, at trying to engage in lots of addicts are scared because they have, you know, it's intimacy, it's intimacy, not just sex is vulnerability, just like you were talking about. And your partners, you know, you can have sex with yourself, you know, I mean, there's lots of different ways you can get your needs met. I would also offer that you might want to journal about this. What is it? You know, when Aaron was saying, what does it mean to you? What, what are you looking for? Is it, I'm looking for connection. I'm looking for touch. Well, real connection is the into me you see. And therefore, you know, a touch is different where I'm paying attention. I'm not objectifying all of those things. So navigating that course. But if you, if you're working with a CSAT, both of you, then some of them already have the training for, uh, for the, it, it, you know, the, you know, like Dr. Rob is a, a clinical sexologist. So there are people who have had that training and can help you. But otherwise, if you are at a place and both of your therapists are you know, saying yes, and you guys are ready for it, then, you know, getting some extra help. You can email me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. And I'll do my best to help you find resources. Okay. My spouse was okay with porn for over half our marriage together, then even watch it together at times. Then she decided one day it was wrong. And if I watch it, it's cheating. I tried to talk about the issue, but it doesn't end well. Thoughts? Hmm. Well, it's hard to comment on this if I don't really know what's actually going on. But yeah, so there are couples that do watch porn together, uh, don't have a problem with porn. Um, but she suddenly decides that it does not feel, so something changed for her. She may feel like um, something happened where she no longer feels safe with you watching porn. She may feel like it be it took priority. She may feel like porn uh, took away the intimacy in your marriage. I mean, there's a number of things that could have happened and it sounds like she doesn't wanna talk about it. So it's potentially something that Maybe as her partner, you honor her request and you get to a place where you can have that discussion because it's clear that something's happening. You said it doesn't end well, which tells me there's some pain involved for her. And I don't know what that is, but yeah, it, the thing is porn in itself is not wrong. Masturbation in itself is not wrong, but you have to have agreements in your marriage uh, about what is what do we mutually agree upon? What is our agreement for our relationship? And if she is no longer in that agreement that you originally made, then it no longer is a mutual agreement, right? So that's something definitely to explore. And I do hope she opens up about what's going on and that the two of you can make kind of a new agreement um, that you both feel really good about, whatever that is moving forward. 
And I was curious, I mean, because porn is such a generic term for, and there are oh, so okay. many different kinds. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm kind of wondering if there was an escalation and it used mm-hmm. to be more pure vanilla porn. And now that there's something, you know, a, a fetishist, there's, there's something uncomfortable to her, you know, in the porn or that it was taking over, et cetera. I would invite you to take uh, uh, in the chat that one of the first things was the self-assessment um, uh, that I, I, you can click through there and you can get your score. You can email me the score, but the porn addiction 101 uh, work group starts this Saturday. And if if you are struggling with that, if your score is a certain number on, you know, on that assessment, it may be, she really did feel like it's, it no longer is something we're doing together. You're all in on this. And here I am over here and it, there's a disconnect. So, so there's a, a lot of opportunity there, you know, to bridge that gap. So, mm-hmm. um, okay. The next one. I am an addict and currently in recovery. I attend counseling once a week, listen to podcasts four to five times a week and attend one-on-one class. I was doing well until last week. I lied to my spouse about scheduling therapy. She found out this is the, this is the, they find out, you know? <laughs> so, okay. Uh, she found out and I lost the trust I had gained over the last month and a half. The lie was stupid and I betrayed my spouse to myself. I knew therapy was a critical part of showing my spouse I am committed to recovery. That led to arguments and out of frustration. I said, she should leave me. I feel terrible about lying about therapy and telling her this. I lost all progress I previously gained. My spouse feels neglected and I'm not prioritizing her. How should I continue to handle this situation? Yeah, so so this is tough and this also happens, okay? So one of the things that we tell our guys when they leave is that Lying cannot be in your inner circle, meaning that lying, if you lie, you reset your sexual sobriety because that is not actually the case. You haven't lost the progress, but you did slip up in in terms of building trust. What we recommend is that you create a 24 hour rule because yes, like you said, the lie is stupid. Some people will lie about like, I, I said, I went to McDonald's and I really went to Taco Bell, right? So, but you have 24 hours and that's an agreement with your partner that if I lie, be it a white lie, be it something like this, that I, I bring it to you and I tell you the truth. And the reason why that's so important is in recovery, we have the opportunity to right our wrongs, but lying we're humans. It's going to happen for many of us that have been compulsive liars for a really long time. You may lie before you even think about it. And then you're so afraid of the reaction or the response that you like, then it's in the closet over here and I don't want to deal with it. And then you're discovered and now it's this thing. So I would, I would talk about potentially getting into the habit of a, a, a time frame where it's like, if I make this mistake, I will own it. I will bring it to you. No matter the consequence, we will talk about it. That shows progress moving forward. Obviously, I think what's upsetting is not even necessarily that first lie, but it's the fact that you kept it and she caught it. Right. Which then leads the the betrayed partner to feel like, well, if I don't catch you, I'll never get your honesty. And that's not a good barometer of trust is to, if I don't catch you, then you're being good. Right. We want you to be the one that is stepping up and showing trust building behaviors. And one of those things is telling the truth when you lie, even a stupid lie. Right. And you talk about why you're canceling therapy that week or, you know, so that's, that is my advice there. And you, you're going to have to obviously spend some time again, moving over this, but you have not lost the time you had in recovery. In other words, you will have all of it. You still spent the time learning and, and connecting and educating yourself, but step up your game, right. And, and show her that I can, I can write this when I make this mistake. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm glad you're going to the SA 101 class. I am a hundred percent confident that Scott has talked about going, you know, the podcast, like anything you're doing that you're just, is coming at you is not accountability. I don't see any 12 step in here. You know, the, the therapist, 
nice, but one therapist for 50 minutes once a week, you know, for an issue that's a chronic condition 24 seven, you know, it's not enough. So you, you don't have enough. You know, the 12 step, our drop-in groups, I just put a link in our, in for our drop-in groups and there's drop-in groups for her too, but you know, a, a different analogy, but you know, that Dr. Rob has talked about, you know, in Aaron's example, if you're going to lie to me about Taco Bell, then how can I believe you about more important things like the trust that we're trying to build. So, okay. you, so it is, and part of our program, if you're working a 12 step program, which I know you, you, you know, you haven't yet, but I would invite you to do, you know, but we have a way to clean that up and we learn, you know, and I hope that you learn the message of it. It was worse. If I don't tell the truth, is she going to be mad when you tell her the truth about whatever you lied about? Sure but she's going to be less mad than when she finds out. So, um, and, and I always think it's interesting and useful to look at, you know, I don't want, I don't want the negative consequence now, but we're never thinking through, but there's going to be a way bigger, you know, consequent negative consequence when she finds out. So if we start thinking things through, which is part of accountability, you, if you had an accountability, you know, peer person, a sponsor, whatever, you could go there and say, I lied about this and they would help you, you know, know what to do and give you the resources to go, okay, you can do it, you know, and go, go tell her the truth. So, the, but I'm with Aaron, like, it's all, it's a journey. You know, we are very broken people. We learn, we can grow. You know, um, recovery takes a couple of years to really get a solid foundation if you're making traction. So abstinence, sobriety, then recovery. That's where we're, we're living it. We don't do, we still don't do things perfectly. And we've got, you know, some time under our belt, but we have the ability to write the ship and make things different. So, okay, next question. My essay partner has friends who are not helpful to a sobriety or a recovery. In my opinion, he claims that's not true. What are your thoughts on this dynamic or people who are not friends of the relationship? Well, you have to decide for your relationship. What are our agreements? Like in my relationship, our friends are friends of the relationship, period. We don't, in other words, dividing so that, you know, you're not sure that if you get into an argument one day that that friend is going to say, you know, you should kick rocks, you know. Not to say that you have to be all couple friends. It's not that, but somebody that supports what is best for you. And so if you are seeing that that is not the case and that they are not, you know, helpful to his recovery, I would be uncomfortable with that. Um, and so I think you can either A, set a boundary here. You can um, share your feelings. You can get outside help for this, but yeah. Yeah obviously we don't want to cut off our partners from all of their friends. Right. But it is imperative that they get friends in recovery, right. They make connections in recovery and also just, yeah. Evaluating who is, who is important in my life and how much time am I actually spending with them? Um, because if they're not, you know, there's some people who have a brother, right. That's not super helpful for my recovery. Am I going to cut my brother off for the rest? No, but I, I moderate how much time I spend with him, what environments we spend time in. Are we going to a bar together, right? Or are we, you know, going out for lunch or grabbing coffee? So I think there's a number of ways that this can be discussed and made either safer or different. But ultimately, um, especially in the healing process, you have a right to say what makes you uncomfortable, period. Um, and figure out what your agreements are. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, yeah. And I was, I think part of healthy boundaries are like, you know, I, I, or, or another thing is when, when you are with this person, you come home and you act differently, you know, there's, you know, and it can be kind of neutral. So I, I see a difference in it and it doesn't make me want to be around you. So, so you, if you're choosing that, but it's always like, you know, for me, it's like, what do I care most about it? If I, if my primary relationship with my partner if somebody is really uncomfortable, if something's making that have a fracture, I sure want to look at that. And I want to take that into consideration. You know, if I'm hanging on to friends, cause I like my friends and, you know, I have fun with them and, you know, it, it, it you know, if they, 
in recovery, in real recovery, we choose the people who are good for us that help us build positive relationships with ourselves and with other people. So, um, but maybe he's not there yet. So um, we shoot, we are out of time and there's some great questions in here and I'm sorry that we won't get to them, but come back, come back. There's more. Uh, there's a few of you that asked stuff and I stuck my email in Tammy, T-A-M-I at Seeking Integrity. You were looking for locations, uh, therapists and locations and stuff. So just email me, tell me where you're located. Tell me what you're looking for. You know, I'll do my best to help you. So yeah, I mean, thank you everybody. so much for everybody. <laughs> I don't know everybody, but you know what? I had I mean, two, in, the, in the last week that I was like, I don't know them. So I reached out to them, you know, and, and one of them got back to me and was like, yes, I work for, you know, I do want to know more about pro-dependence. I want to work from that lens and put it, yay. Cause that's what I'm looking for is I'm looking to make sure that they are going to be helpful to you. And um, they're going to work from a pro-dependent lens. They're going to help support the recovery journey for both of you. Check out our free drop-in groups. And, and this webinar will be posted, you know, on our website, podcast podcasts are great, but it isn't the interaction. So please, the drop-in groups are so good for yeah. each of you. Um, our family specialist, Tamara, co-hosts the Wednesday one. People love her. All of the hosts are great, but, you know, uh, we hear, you know, we, we chat with her about, you know, how connected she is to those, um, to those groups. So anyway, thanks, Aaron. See you soon. Thank you. Bye, Have everybody. Have a great night, everyone.